Shomra Byug. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Sure Look. Sure Listen, the podcast that takes a pop at culture. Sure Look. Sure Listen. 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 Oh, fantastic, Ben. That's very good and very exciting. But sure, look at it. We don't have time to get into how good and exciting everything is because we've got lots of good and exciting news to look at, but also some bad news. But sure, look, Ben, (laughs) first of all, we're going to have to look at the tragic passing of a legend of the industry. And then we're going to have a little look at why Barbie has broken some very big record, very small records, but Barbie's broken them nonetheless. Then we're going to have a look at Irish People Suspos, the new film trailer, Foe. We're going to have a look at the next film in your favourite genre, What's Going On in This Creepy Office, The Other Black Girl. And then we're going to have a look at Zack Snyder's favourite film genre, All of Sci-Fi, with the new trailer for Rebel Moon. Then speaking of Rebel Moon... You, but not I, because no great Star Wars fan am I, have seen both episodes of Ahsoka Episodes 1 and 2, Season 2. <laughs> sure, listen, Michael, if that wasn't what? enough. Is it? I think it actually is. I think we've, we've gotten... Michael, you said before this, we could do a whole episode on Rebel Moon and Zack Schneider's fucking fever dream sci-fi marathon. But anyway... It's mad! It's mad. But anyway, come here to me. If that wasn't enough, we're always going to take a look at an absolute classic, Michael that came out 24 years ago in our favourite segment for us, not for anybody else, for us, Exhumed. We watched The Mummy with Brendan Fraser. We did. We watched The Mummy. It's our favourite segment, Ben, because for us, it's quite low effort. It's quite low effort and we've watched these (laughs) movies before. It's lovely. Yeah, We just have to watch a film. It's so easy. It's much easier than (laughs) digging into the history of the Irish Classification Office. Benjamin. Yeah. We're starting the week on sad news with the yeah. death of the legendary voice actor Arlene Sorkin. Yeah, Harley Quinn on Batman the Animated Series, Michael Arlene Sorkin has passed away at the age of 67. That's not a great innings. Not a great innings. Um, according to her representation in in that Hollywood over there, oh, yeah. uh, she has been sick for some time uh, with an illness that has not been confirmed, uh, that has not been uh, disclosed. And she passed away um, yesterday. Um, Well, it is not our place to speculate, Ben. Ben. No, not at all. Famously, not just the voice actress who played Harley Quinn, but also essentially the creator of Harley Quinn in some ways. Yeah. So Paul Denis is the writer for Batman the Animated Series. And he was very good friends with Arlene Sorkin before he had created the scripts for Batman the Animated Series. And he was familiar with her work from a show called Days of Our Lives. Oh, the the televisual drama series in the that televisual, America. Yeah, the televisual drama series from that America. And what he basically did was there's a there's a dream episode, I believe, or something like that, where she wore a Harlequin costume. Oh, and that gave him a fetish. And that, uh, well, I can't speak to that, Michael, but yes, yes. <laughs> uh, yes. So basically Definitely. he saw that and went, oh, that would be good in a cartoon, wouldn't it? Jesus. Um, oh, and I'll so get that into kids' minds. I want to interview Paul Denis one day, so I'm going to take that back. I, I, Paul, if you're listening, you know, you can still come on the show and have a chat with us. <laughs> uh, but anyway, saw Arlene Sorkin in what I believe is a dream episode or a dream sequence on Days of Our Lives saw her in the costume and went that'd be a good character to bring on to an animated kids show that'd be good and Mm. so Arlene Sorkin was written this part and it gave us surprisingly Harley Quinn Harley Quinn didn't exist before Paul Dini or Dini put her in the Batman the Animated series and that is mind-boggling that a character that now is ubiquitous and everywhere in pop culture. Especially at Halloween. Especially at Halloween. Or Comic-Cons, Michael. They're everywhere. Harley Quinn's make up a huge section of the pie chart that is nerddom. Yes. And it's a big slice. And that character has only really been in existence since the 90s, since the early 90s. Ben, um, I, thought, yeah. I thought you were saying Paul the Knee. Like he was some sort of gangster and that was his mob name. I, I took it to be a heel wrestler. Oh, right. <laughs> Paul the Knee McWigan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ben. Yeah. Sure, look, um, 
a good legacy to leave behind at the very least uh, an enormously popular character based on you in in the, in the culture yes uh, not based on me ladies and gentlemen based on Arlene no. Sorkin very important Arlene Sorkin. but yeah just a tremendous le- and she really carved it out because the voice was incredibly unique um, it was that strange kind of New York uh, mobster twang. I don't know what you'd call it. Um, but it really formed the character and shaped it in a lot of different ways. So a very tragic passing. Um, there have been lots of outpourings of uh, kind of condolence. Uh, James Gunn, Mark Hamill, you know, big, big names. That marks two absolute legends of Batman the Animated Series that we've lost in two years, Michael. Um, Kevin Conroy and... Uh, Arlene Sorkin now so there you that's go. true that's true Ben that's, this is what happens it has been 30 odd years since that show came out so it's uh, that's it starts to happen sadly sadly yeah absolutely um, speaking of uh, not so sad things Michael yes you go told on. me that Barbie's done things Barbie Ben Barbie the film Barbie have you seen it I uh, have yeah very good yeah yeah the film Barbie Ben has passed Avatar to become the highest grossing film in cinema history in Ireland. In, in, in Ireland. In Ireland. Mm. <laughs> this is mad. The Ireland box office is mad. It's always a little bit weirder than other countries. I know. It's delightful. It is. It's very good. But it, it tickles my wickle to no end that the Barbie movie is now the highest grossing movie in cinema history in Ireland. In Ireland. There's nothing that quite takes the wind out of your sails. Like that little caveat at the end of something. In Ireland. We're quite in Ireland. popular. In Ireland. In Ireland, yeah. <laughs> it's it's, it's not made, the ben, same. Would you believe it's made nearly 9 million euro in Ireland? Just, what? It's nearly 9 million euro in Ireland the Barbie movie has made. That's uh, one fifty <laughs> per person. <laughs> It's a shite amount of money to make. It's a shite amount of money, Ben, obviously, for an international <laughs> cinema. But is that for all Ireland, our box office record is worth? Yeah, yeah. But for Ireland, that's an incredible... That's 150 per person alive in Ireland, Ben. Yeah, no, it's true. We've all we've all just thrown 150 in the kitty, in the trucker yeah. box for Barbie. You, yeah, <laughs> someone just rattled around with a little pink trucker box with Barbie on it and got 150 off every living person in Ireland and... Now, now, the Barbie movie has made 9 million euro. Anyway, there's nothing much more to say about it other than Barbie is now the, officially the, the highest grossing cinema movie in Ireland. I can't speak. Ben, I'm so it's, tired. We stayed up too I'm late last so night. I'm so tired. We stayed up too late last night d and <laughs> And both of us. Lot, one of the worst <laughs> podcasts we've ever done. Speaking, Ben, of yeah. uh, being replaced by robots because you're too tired. Yes. <laughs> There's a new sci-fi film coming out in the genre of it's pretending to be sci-fi but really it's a tense and taut r- thriller about relationships. Ah, uh, Michael, this is a Black Mirror episode given an old stretch and they went, "Who who's hot right now?" Oh, the, the Irish. People love the, the Irish. Irish. We'll get the Irish in. We'll get that famous Irish actor with a difficult to pronounce name. What was it again? Pa- Paul Miskel. Pa- yes, pa- Paolo Miskel. <laughs> Mm. From the from the often overlooked region, Italian influenced region of uh, Paul Miskel. Of ben, so Paul Miskel and Sorcerer Ronan are a couple of Americans. Yes, this is the bit that gets me right. Go on. So they're playing Junior and Hen are the are the characters that they're playing. Yeah. And Junior and Hen seem to be living in a dust bowl type scenario. They live in the world of Interstellar. Yeah, pretty much. Before before Murph gives her dad a, a, a bloody what's for. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's that world. Yeah, it's exactly and, that world. Yeah, and it looks... This has a lot of classic, high-end sci-fi kind of DNA in it. It, it looks to be a little bit of... Interstellar, it looks to be a little bit of moon. There's a, there's a touch of moon about this. Is there a touch of moon about it, Ben? Because they're going Sam to replace Rockwell. him with a robot. Yeah, with Sam Rockwell. But it's inverted. This time the human goes up mm. and the robot goes down. So it's very hard to tell in this trailer what we got, Michael, because it looks like it gets very dark very quickly. Yeah. You know what vibes I'm getting from it as well? One. 
ex machina. Yeah, there's there's big, oh, you've done something now and you probably shouldn't have done that. You've let something in or you've let something breathe life into another thing. And <laughs> Also, uh, specifically ex machina because it's mostly Irish people in just a kind of uh, an intimate relationship focused triple hander based around sci-fi themes so what i kind of like about that one of my favorite one of my favorite kind of genres of late michael is the soft sci-fi genre where it's there as a setting and it doesn't waste too much time with over mcguffening things where it's like well now this is just a trailer michael so we can't actually say that it doesn't do this but it seems to be one extreme concept used to propel a thought experiment if that makes sense mm, what if humans could be robots what not quite what if you were given an opera but th- it's a very simple kind of classic relationship dilemma what happens if you're given an opportunity that benefits you massively but will impact your relationship what should you do mm. yeah yeah but in this case it's given the extreme where it's like well junior's going to space he's going up into space ben yeah, well, one of the things that I find as, it, as we were kind of getting at there is why have they made them American? <laughs> it's gay. It's great, isn't it? They- I love the fact that they've cast the two biggest Irish actors of the current era and put them as Southern Americans. But here's the here's the thing, right? Not only would on. it be equally as desolate to film it somewhere like I don't know the Morn Mountains or the Wicklow Mountains or something. <laughs> Do you know what Go I mean? On. You could choose a desolate location in Ireland and have it done that way. They're clearly rural inspired characters because there's gun shooting and there's there's I, I ain't quitting you kind of vibes. Yeah, there's vests. And there's vests. Oh, so many string vests, lads. But there's there's no reason that this couldn't be set in Ireland. Now, obviously, it's, it's an Americana inspired thing. So fair enough. But two Irish actors in a role doing silly accents is... A waste, in my opinion. No, I think it's gas. I think it's gas, and I'm kind of <laughs> hoping. I'm kind of hoping there's a like this Act Three twist where it turns out they actually are Irish, and this whole thing is some sort of weird social experiment. And they're like, "Oh Jesus, be God, me whole me voice was gone all weird there the whole time, but I'm grand now. Don't be worrying." Yeah, so it, it's it's a pretty weird one. So again, Michael, in in what seems to be the Hollywood trend at the moment for any kind of you know, any kind of new sci-fi thing. This is based on a novel um, by Ian Reid, who's a kind of mm. a, a stellar working sci-fi author. He does a lot of stuff like that. Um, How old is this book, Ben? Because you've been giving out recently that people are adapting books too quickly. 2018, Michael. Oh my God, just churn them out. <laughs> Get them out there. <laughs> they're only getting them and they're uh, they're running on. So it, this, uh, this is quite a popular book. Um in kind of a cult following sense and yeah he's uh, it's set in the near future and is narrated by junior who lives with his wife henrietta or hen uh, on a remote farm now michael on a remote farm just set it in ireland they could have done it in the burn they could have done it in the burn just put it in the burn that could have been in the burn uh yeah so it's it one of the the best things about this michael is one night a stranger knocks on the door so it's a, it's a real kind of uh philosophical thought experiment and that's terence and terence is offering them an opportunity uh to go to space and they have to make a decision and there'll be a biomechanical duplicate brought mm. in uh to help his wife and it's uh it's about the either the falling apart of their marriage or the the growth of other things and yeah very interesting so uh, this is very popular in 2018 um and yeah it's it comes from his own ian reed the author of the book said that it came from his own experiences growing up on a farm in remote ontario in canadian remote ontario that's canada ben that's not even america yeah ben, that was some fabulous wikipedia reading from you there it was it's very solid of Speaking of reading the Wikipedia article instead of doing Listen research, you cheeky tired. shit. Right? Yeah, go on. Listen go on. here. Go this on. is a weekly pop culture podcast. I'm yeah, sorry I don't have time to write my own expressive breakdown of yeah. what I did on flashcards. I'll do that for you next week, Michael. Will do I? the flashcards. I'll get, yeah, I'll get flashcards. Flash and I'll write it in haikus, Michael, and give you the creative originality you're so clearly thirsting for in this podcast. 
Very good. Speaking of people having Fuck unnecessary you. emotional breakdowns because of work-related stress, Ben. <laughs> nice. We got, we got a new trailer for a, a TV show in your favourite genre. What's going on in this creepy office? Oh, Michael, what is going on in this creepy office? The other black girl. I know what's going on in that creepy office, Michael. Go on, what is it? It's racism. No, oh, it's racism. I knew it was going to be racism. <laughs> Benjamin, this show is might as well be Jordan Peele's What's Going On in This Creepy Office. Yeah, what's going on in this creepy office, lads? Um, someone, so- <laughs> Ben, someone has watched Severance and Get Out too close together. Uh, yeah, they, they, they have, and they've made this series. Now, again, Michael. Again, what? Michael. Is this, this based, is based on a popular on a book, book. from 2018? <laughs> Is it based on a popular book from 2018, Ben? Oh, it's even worse. This is based on a popular book from 2021. <laughs> oh my God, that's so recent. Um, Benjamin, so, has anyone even finished reading it? So it's from, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's from uh, Zakia Dahlia Harris. And I may have gotten that wrong and I apologise if I did. Um, I very much tried to, to get it right. Um, however, yeah, it's starring um, Sinclair Daniel as Nella. And Nella seems to be a young black girl trying to make her way in the cutthroat, cutthroat mm. corporate environment of Debt America. Because America's... Oh, debt. yeah. Michael, I don't know if you know this, but America's shit. Oh, terrible stuff going on, especially in offices. And it's it's a little bit shitter for people of colour. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah, it's extra shit for them, Michael. Extra oh, shit seems- for them. America. Useless. Yeah, no good. No good. So we got a trailer for this, Michael, and it's Nella's experience is trying to climb the corporate ladder as a black woman in a white dominated office environment. And Michael, things get pretty fucking weird. It looks like it's weird. It's a weird and creepy office, Ben. There's some sort of psychological goings on. Yeah, weird and creepy offices, Michael. It's a brand new genre and it's sweeping the nation because we're all in. <laughs> say it with me now, ladies and gentlemen. Late stage capitalism. Yeah. Oh, it's late stage capitalism again, then. It's the brave company owners, those brave capitalists that I worry about, that this ungrateful employee is going to take down their hard built system. Yeah. So I don't know if she does. I don't know if she I don't know if this is a, a thing of let's really suck it to the, the corporate environment. I think this is a psychological horror about what it takes to survive in the corporate environment. So uh, the other black girl, the reason it's named that is another black girl is hired in this predominantly white space. And mm. it seems to be based around the notion that oddly, because you are hired in America sometimes based on your race as what they call kind of a a token hire, Michael, in a, in a kind of uh, critical race Div- theory. Diversity hire is the it. word you're looking for. No, but it's it's you know if we if we're to peel that back and look at it, it's it's token hiring. It's it's where we kind of oh, put it is in that there. Your opinion. Uh, it's not entirely my opinion, but you can get fucked. That's critical race theory at work, Michael. Um. And it looks at that and then there's another uh, person of colour employed at the same time. It's how it creates a bizarre competition between those two people of colour. Um, oh, but that's not what the trailer seemed to be implying. The trailer seemed to be implying that they bring some sort of black culture into the office and maybe that's what triggers the weird stuff starting to happen. Well, it could be that. It could be a clash of two very, very segregated worlds. Not intentionally th- segregated, but, you know. I thought it was the fact that there were now black people in the office and they were interacting in different ways that brought the view of the the powerful, spectral, evil white forces down on them. Yeah, well, I guess it, it it does seem to touch on that quite a bit. They've they've rocked the apple cart a bit too much, as it were. Mm, by doing high fives and whatnot. Yeah, but in in the book, Michael, um, Hazel is the second girl who's hired. And um, Hazel is, at first, seems to be very much an ally, another, another person of colour for Nella to kind of get on with. But as the thing progresses... Um, Hazel seems to become more and more sinister as a character so we're not sure if it's Hazel who brings that in and that's played a little bit in the trailer we see that Hazel is talking to friends of Nella saying is Nella okay she seems to be becoming a little unhinged like she seems to be struggling a little bit in the office environment so we won't we won't know Michael it's Jordan Peele 101 <laughs> it's not Jordan Peele though Ben it's John Hamm it's John Hamm no it's not John Hamm either um, 
So when the the author of this, Zakia Dalia Harris, was asked, you know, what kind yeah. of influenced the narrative? There's some pretty big influences on this. Um, yeah, Jordan Peele. It, well, actually, yes. Harris cited Jordan Peele's movie Get Out um, and Ira Levin's The Stepford Wives inspiration for the novel. So we can see again that that kind of subtle, high-end uh, sci-fi influence is, is there. And then uh, she also cited some pretty stellar works of um, black American fantasy uh octavia e butler's kindred i don't know if you've ever had the pleasure of octavia e octavia or I, octavia e. Butler. i think you've told me about it benjamin yeah so that was a tv series adapted by fx a couple of uh months ago now i don't know it's all happening so fast michael um tony morrison's sula is there as well T- uh, tony morrison a, a massive author in that regard and then a very important work called passing uh, by someone called Nella Larson, and it's all about how black people are forced to try and fit into white society to survive. Um, so there's a there's a lot of influences going into that. Um, but then, um, obviously, directly citing Get Out by Jordan Peele. America's rubbish, isn't it, Ben? Ben. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you what, though. Go on. You've been complaining about people making TV shows and movies based on books that were released a wet day ago. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> so I have a solution for you. Yeah. How about yeah. we get a new film from noted director with a lack of restraint, Zack Snyder, <laughs> and he just bases it on everything. Absolutely everything all at everything. the same time. Just everything you've ever seen, Ben. Yes. How would you like everything you've ever seen in a movie? Yeah. So. Well, Ben, I tell you what, <laughs> it won't fit. So it's going to have to be two movies. Is this two movies? Yeah, did you did you watch the trailer? It's, I didn't realise it was two movies. Yeah, yeah, it's part one is in December and part oh, two is next year. Fuck's sake. It's great stuff. Great stuff altogether, Ben. Of course, we're talking about Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon on Netflix. Oh, dear. The film which we're told sprung forth from Zack Snyder's failed attempt to make a Star Wars. Yeah. But, Ben, let's just play a stupid game, though. Yeah. Let's play... Let's play Spot the Influence. Just, let's do five minutes, because if we do more, we, we could take up the whole rest of the podcast doing sure, this. Sure, sure. But what influences are in this? It's gas. This is one of the gassest trailers of all time. Uh, so, the biggest and strongest one, I think, that we could probably look at, and the one that jumped out to me, Michael, is Denis Villeneuve's Dune. Yeah, Dune. There was a lot of Dune in it, for sure. There was people going, Bruh. But even like the the color grading on a lot of aspects of this, the giant monolithic statues, the 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 seemingly very very formal kind of hierarchy that runs in the society seems to be yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, the vein of prophecy running through the whole thing. But this time it's not a boy, it's a girl because oh, it's twenty twenty three. Because it's twenty twenty three. Then the other huge sci fi vibe that I got, Michael, was uh, Warhammer forty k. There's lots of Warhammer in it, Ben. They basically dress up as Imperial Guard commissars at one stage. There's there's big commissar vibes coming off a lot of this, Michael. And I was like, oh, okay. It's All a right. Of, bit, of, bit of Warhammer as well. Your favourite and mine, Ed Screen, Ben. Ed Screen is just one of the Adeptus Militarum. That's he's just Warhammer. He's, he's Don, just, John Warhammer. He's just Johann Sebastian Warhammer. That's yeah, all he is. Good. But then, Michael, we got other massive things. And one of the ones I think that's huge is Saga, the comic book. Oh, go on. I got massive. There's a whole section with the griffin. And then there's a very kitsch funeral at one yeah, point. The- there's definitely griffins and kids funerals. The griffins, Ben, are simil- and you'll excuse me for using the language of the Gen Zers, but the griffins are simultaneously giving both Harry Potter and Avatar. It's uh, there's a lot going on, man. There's so much going on. <laughs> there's a lot going on. So it, it seems like it seems like there's going to be a team up of like four or five diverse characters. Yeah, but mostly white fellas. Yeah, and. And one of them looks to be some sort of John Carter of Mars, Tarzan-esque wild man who is going to have a Navi-esque connection with the wild beasts of some sort of frontier planet. Oh, that's bizarre. become a griffin rider. <laughs> He's straight out of World of Warcraft. I, oh, Michael, this is 
bizarre. Um, it's great. This is the most I've. This is so exciting. Ben. I there's there's Stars Wars. Yeah. Half of them have lightsabers. There are lightsabers. So this is the other interesting thing. So this it's very important to point this out. When Disney were announcing their next phase mm. uh, with Kathy, what's her name? Kennedy. Kathy Kennedy. Kathy Kennedy launched Kathy. a slate of things. Kathleen Kennedy. Kathleen yeah, Kennedy. Yeah, no, we'll call her Kathy Kennedy. Kathy Let's Kennedy. Go with Kathy so Kennedy. Kathy Kennedy comes out and she's like, hey, we're going to make more Star Wars. That's the voice I'm giving Kathy Kennedy. It's, All right. It's canon now. Uh, yeah, we'll run with it. And everyone was like, yeah, amazing. It's like, we're going to give one to you and to you and to you and to you, Mr. Snyder. Uh, and everyone was like, woo, amazing. Yeah. And then about six months in, they were like, ah, not you, Mr. Snyder. No, forget about nah. it. But he had already been working on the script for quite a while at this point. And he was like, oh, all right, I'll just, I'll just, I'll change the font. Yeah. And I'll still make it myself for Netflix. I'll do that. I don't. I'm just going to make it. I'm just going to make it myself and I'm going to put all my favourite things in it. <laughs> all of them. Yeah, it's fucking oh, There's a bit set on the Firefly planet where people are suddenly from the American South. Oh, fucking. And, and they're shooting rifles. Then there's Digimon Hansu. Digimon Hansu is there for some reason. <laughs> What's he doing there? <laughs> he's there and he's in like some sort of Baroque armour. I can't wait for this. I can't wait for this absolute nonsense. He looks like he's straight out of Chronicles of Riddick. Yeah. So so here's the weirdest thing for me, Michael. What? I watched this and I was kind of like, yeah. Yeah, I'll watch this. This looks yeah. fun. And I'm disgusted with myself. <laughs> As a committed snob, Michael. A committed yeah. snob, mind you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How dare I? How dare you watch this? How dare I be excited for this? I don't know. I kind of like it. It looks to be the tightest. This is a trailer. They call it a teaser trailer, Michael. I think that's a very liberal use of the word teaser. They basically show us every single facet of that universe. Yeah, but Ben, the universe is so diverse and ridiculous that, you know... Even if this is a six hour film or a seven hour film, we're still probably only going to get 10 seconds of each of these weird cultures. That's all we can get. Is it an anthology series? I think I'd prefer that. No, it's not an anthology series, Ben, because in the end we see um, Ed Screen and Sophia Patella and what's his name? Charlie Hunnam. We haven't even mentioned Charlie, Charlie Hunnam, whatever Hunnam he's up is to. There. Charlie Hunnam's in it. We see them all teaming up and it, it looks. It looks like it's going to be basically mad heroes from a diverse background of worlds and abilities oh, come bizarre. together like a bonkers D&D sci-fi party to take down Ed Screen. It's fucking weird. <laughs> Very exciting, Ben. This is the most exciting thing I've ever seen. It even has an overly dramatic voiceover from Anthony Hopkins. Oh, it's very strange. Which one of you will die today? All of you, apparently. Yeah, gas. Ben, this is the most exciting thing that's going. I can't wait to see this. Yeah, I I found it so interesting and so bizarre, Michael. But again, it's just Star Wars with a different coat of paint. Is it though? Is well, it? There's a se- there's a section, Michael, and this is this is this is a segue that I'm setting up, Michael. So get get oh, ready. Oh, you're setting up a segue. There's a section where we see one of the. I'm going to do the movement for Michael, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, this is an audio format and very hard to understand what I'm doing. But there's a yeah. section where we see a female character dual wielding light swords. Is that what we're going to um, call them? Energy sabers. Energy <laughs> energy sticks. And yeah. she does this sweeping fall down and she kind of does a crouch and a land as if she's just brought them down in an arc. Michael, that's straight up to the Ahsoka fucking trailer. Uh, the Ahsoka trailer stole that, Benjamin. Everyone has been activating two energy weapons at the same time for years. Dar- started with Darth Maul and went downhill from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Down her tube, even. Yeah, right kind of down. Big, uh, kind of big pipe. <laughs> yeah, right down. They love a big pipe in Star Wars. Michael, speaking of things they love in Star Wars, I've seen Ahsoka, episode one and two. And Michael... Get out of here. Dave Filoni is continuing his thing of, yeah, we're just going to do the original Star Wars stuff again. We're gonna, gonna, gonna oh, do it good. Again. <laughs> yeah. This time, Michael, he seems to have been sat down by somebody and told, we can't just call the characters back and do it the same. 
And he's like, why not? Okay. It's like, we have to change it a little bit. A little Go bit. On. So I think we could look at Ahsoka season one or episodes one and two at the very least as Star Wars parallels. Um, and I'm not certain that isn't a project that's been announced by Kathleen Kennedy. Uh, we're going to do a whole series of uh, multiverses in Star Wars called Star Wars <laughs> Parallels. Uh, uh, that might be a thing. She's heading further and further into Rick uh, Rick territory there. Ben. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, we're on the way down. We're in the decline now, Michael. It's a, it's an ever oh, it's an ever widening gyre. It's it's game oh, over. Fantastic. But anyway, come here to me. Um, what? Actually, I want to pitch that to Disney. We should pitch that to Star Wars Parallels, a multiverse. Do, do that. They mm. do it with everything else. Yeah, do, uh, do an episode with Rick and Morty, but it's Star Wars. Uh, sure, why not? It's a parallel universe. It might happen. Yeah, exactly. Might happen. Come here to me, though. Um, in this, Michael, it's it's a it's a well made two ser- two episodes. They were enjoyable. I I think surprisingly for me, they don't worry so much about. Here's all the Star Wars stuff. Boom, 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 boom. It's it's a tighter story than we've gotten maybe in Mandalorian season three. Mandalorian and I think season three, aka what's going on in Star Wars. Yeah, exactly. So we've we've it's a I suppose because all that work has been put in on the Mandalorian, it's easier for Dave Filoni and the crew to tell this story. So for those that don't know, Ahsoka launched this week. Yeah. Ahsoka is Anakin Skywalker's former Padawan who turns her back on the Jedi Order and leaves it behind. Right? Because they're a bunch of bad eggs. Because they're a bunch of bad eggs. Not necessarily that, but Ahsoka Tano is forced to recognise the fact that any dogma, be it for the side of the light in the form of the Jedi or the side of darkness in the form of the Sith, is not a good thing. Dogma can only lead to restriction, one way or the other. So Ahsoka Tano turns her back on that and becomes essentially what's known in canon as a grey Jedi... Or, oh, a great or, Jedi. Or a grey Force user who is aligned to neither side of the Force. Oh, that seems like the most reasonable position to take. Yes, moderate positions, Michael. Famously, famously mm. grand to take. Absolutely. On one side, we have people who have a lot of rules and, you know, it, it, there's a lot of bureaucracy. And on the other side, we have people who kill um, without distinction oh, Very very easy to take a nice central position on that Nice central position on that Just kill people but make sure you fill out the forms <laughs> So come here to me Yes go on What we get in this Michael Is kind of an expanding of that universe Again It touches on the themes of I don't know if we should align ourselves to a single dogma We don't get a lot out of it But looking at episode 1 And I'll try and do this without spoilers Episode 1 As we as we can imagine Michael Is 100% Introducing the world that we get here And in episode 1 It is Dave Filoni's favourite hits From the Star Wars universe it's, it's Dave Filoni's greatest hits Not Dave Filoni himself It's George Lucas's greatest hits As listened to and curated by Dave Filoni So Okay Ben yeah. I know you're trying to avoid spoilers But I need more specifics here What's going on? Alright so what happens is Have you seen the original Star Wars trilogy? I assume you have I know you're no great fan But I'm assuming you've seen them I'm disgusted that you've even asked me that Look at the, look at the absolute disdain on my face Benjamin That's how you look at me all the time Yeah but now I mean it Oh. Now it's not just <laughs> resting disdain face. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, resting disdain face. Or DF. Come here to me. What, what happens is, in the original Star Wars, there's a famous scene where um, there's a bunch of rebels trying to enter an Imperial fleet using an old passcode. Okay, this is a very oh, cool. famous thing. And it, there's a, a lot of deception happening in the original Star Wars. And this is inverted here because in the opening scenes, we're introduced to a Rebel Alliance star cruiser that's transporting a prisoner. Oh. Oh, ah. And this time, it's not Princess Leia. Oh, like no. Like it is in the original. It's, it's bloody, it's a character that we've seen from The Mandalorian, Morgan Elspeth. I don't know who that is. She's the weird commander that has a scrap with Ahsoka Tano for the 
Uh, oh, Beskar yeah, spear. Yeah. She uses the yeah, Beskar yeah. spear. Yeah. So she's being transported for interrogation by the New Order or the New Alliance. The New Order is a different thing. Ignore that. Uh, and then there's two Jedi that want to get on the ship to have a chat with her. I thought the Jedi were all dead. Oh, that's what we all thought, Michael. That's what we all thought. And then... And yes. then... Go on. There's a whole scene that plays out very much like the original, where they're kind of questioning the two uh, usurper, or not the two usurpers, but the two interlopers that come on board. And Michael, it's only bloody Ray Stevenson. Oh, Ray Stevenson, he's a grand, grand and, uh, lad. And unfortunately passed away, yeah. Um, yeah. And it's him and his apprentice. So it's Balin and Shinati is, is, are the name of them. And Michael, we kind of get a sense very, very quickly that all is not right with these two, because... One of the interesting things that happens is we, we this is all spoiled from the trailer, ladies and gentlemen. These are the antagonists for season one of Ahsoka. So what happens is they are very quickly shown to be really after Morgan Elspeth and they want to get her and talk to her and question her. And the Admiral is like, no. And he mocks them for being knockoff Jedis. And then an no. interesting thing happens. Balin comes forward and he says look, give us what we want and we can avoid all of this. There's no need to insult us. You know, everything is fine. Just give us what we want and we'll leave. And he means it. There's, there's, a, there's a strong strain of sincerity in this scene. And he means every word of what he's saying. And the Admiral laughs at him again and he goes to pull his blaster and uh, he does an absolute classic. Balan does an absolute kind of classic uh, Darth Vader thing, you know, where he chokes the guy in the original series while he, he i find your lack of faith disturbing you know that famous scene no nope. okay well, famously i haven't seen it i haven't seen it because you're a cook um so come here to me <laughs> <laughs> wow well. so uh what we see is there's a famous kind of sound effect that comes on in the original um star wars when vader originally uses the force and they kind of do away with it after that it returns here michael and as balan is turning the admiral's kind of fist around with the gun in it and stopping him from using it we hear the famous kind of original vader force sound and then he spears him with his orange lightsaber oh it's a whole thing so that kicks us off michael it is a love letter to the original star wars series um and it's bizarre and the, the hits just keep coming after that michael so um we're then introduced to Ahsoka, and Ahsoka is on the Dathomir planet. He's on one of the planets where uh, the Dathomir witches were based. I don't know if you're aware of the Dathomir witches in Star Wars lore. Benjamin, no great Star Wars fan am I. Oh, that's unfortunate. There's a an order called the Night Witches. Uh, they are magic users in the Star Wars universe. Not force users, magic yeah. users, and they rival the oh, power levels. Oh, magic as well. Huh? There's magic as well. There's magic yeah. as well. Oh, yeah. great. Now, they say it's on the force spectrum, but it's just magic. Okay. It's just magic. Okay, so don't worry about it. Anyway, she is on that to get a very important object, which is a map which will lead her to Admiral Thrawn. And uh, that is what our good pal Ahsoka is doing. Okay? Admiral Thrawn, he's a blue fella. Yeah. So the reason that... Exactly. The reason that... Uh, Balin and Shinati are after Morgan Elspeth is she knows where Thrawn is and the reason that Rosario Dawson's Ashoka is after this little map is so she can find him. Now, what I didn't realise, Michael, is that she's hunting not Thrawn for the sake of Thrawn, but also Ezra who is a character from Star Wars Rebels. Yeah, now, he, has a, he has a lightsaber that's also a gun. Yes, this is a massive spoiler for Star Wars Rebels, but it turns out at the end of the final season of Star Wars Rebels, Ezra sacrifices himself and Thrawn um, and holds Thrawn in place while they are sucked into hyperspace by the space whales of Star Wars. Yeah, yeah, they get, they get into sci-fi. They get into sci-fi. And yeah, so that's uh, pretty much what's happening, Michael. Uh, there, She comes out of the temple after doing a few Star Wars things um, to kind of activate the temple and make it give up its secrets and stuff like that. You know, a classic feeling of force about the temple. Classic Star Wars stuff. And then uh, what happens is she comes out and oh, there's only a couple of droids there to take her out, Michael. Oh, no. Now, luckily, Ahsoka Tano is a big old badass and she makes pretty short work of them, Michael. And then there's a self-destruct sequence. She's to run back to the ship. Oh, classic Star Wars yeah. stuff. As the whole planet goes, ba-boom. Is it any use, Ben? Ah, it's very good. Yeah. No, it is. It is. It is. 
a better version. It's the promise of Mandalorian Season 1 brought to fruition, but with the Force a bit more. Is it going to save Star Wars, Ben? Nah, I mean, they late? say that every time. I don't know if it's too late, Michael. The, the, problem, the problem with Dave Filoni, this is, this is a love letter for hardcore fans, right? So hardcore fans are going to watch Ahsoka and go, oh, yes, this is stuff from the Clone Wars. This is stuff from Rebels. This is the stuff from blah, 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 blah. But it's not accessible to new Star Wars fans because you pretty much... And the, the big accusation of this, Michael, is this is the this is the last season of Rebels. This is the follow on season of Rebels. This is essentially Rebels season five, I think. And mm. that's true. But it means that there's a whole cache of lore. Like there's a massive chunk of the Star Wars universe or the Filoni verse at this point, let's be honest, that you have to understand before you can engage with this properly. There were a couple of characters introduced here, Michael, where I was gone, huh? Who, mm. who the fuck is that? One of the one of the best examples of this, Michael, is the lightsaber droid is back. What's that? So <clears throat> one of Dave Filoni's very interesting additions to the Star Wars universe is it turns out that when Jedi make their lightsabers, they go into, I suppose, what you would call uh uh blacksmith droid and that droid helps them design the blueprints and um come up with their own unique lightsabers so this is why every jedi has their own unique lightsaber they are coached through the process by a a centuries old droid that holds all the blueprints for every lightsaber ever made by a jedi in him no, oh, how, how very exciting. And this character was introduced in a throwaway episode of The Clone Wars, Michael. Or it could have been Rebels. I can't remember which. Um, and it's voiced by David Tennant. Oh, old David Tennant. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is he? And now yeah, they, just keep getting, they just keep getting famous people to do droids. Yeah. And now, Michael, he's back. But he's in live action this time. How good. And he's a very worthy addition because it's through that that they're able to analyse the footage from the... They're able to analyze the footage from the event with Balin and his apprentice where they take out all the the rebels and he analyzes their lightsabers and identifies who they are. So it turns out that Balin is a former Jedi who oh. turned away from the path, not unlike Ahsoka Tano. Oh, that's so many of them. Yeah. So I think it's it's heavily hinted at in this, Michael, that um, Balin in this particular case is going to be her mirror image or a glimpse oh. at what will happen if she continues down the path of you know Chopping people up yeah exactly um it, we then go through introducing other characters sabine is reintroduced um harris and dulla is introduced that's mary elizabeth winstead mary elizabeth winstead from out of um cloverfield lane yeah out of cloverfield lane or scott pilgrim versus low world or yeah. you know Sky all those High. things so she's there she's married to ewan mcgregor so that's a nice little Star Wars. Star Wars. Yeah, that's nice. So anyway, um, all that happens um, and it's, you know, it's fine. It's good. It's well-made TV. It's not perfect. It's going to drive, it's going to whip the old Filoni boys into a frenzy. Oh, good. The old Filoni boys. Benjamin. Yes. Speaking of things that are perfect. Though, oh, yeah. For this week's podcast episode of this podcast sure looks to listen to podcast taste pop culture we're doing one of our famous exhumes oh we love an exhumed here michael but benjamin go on this week exhumed has an extra special double meeting yeah because we're also doing exhumed of the mummy bed and but he gets exhumed that's how it works michael that's, that's how, how egyptology happens. goes and Benjamin, in the film, they definitely shouldn't have exhumed the mummy. That oh, was a terrible idea. Leave Arnold Vuslu. What's his name? Leave him in there. Leave him in there, Ben. Leave no him use. in there. Don't be taking uh, him out. The, the question is, should we have exhumed him or not, Ben? Uh, Michael, I unashamedly adore this film. So I right out the gate, Michael, I'm biased. Go on, then. This film is nearly 25 years old. It's 24 years old at the time of recording, Michael. Funnily enough, yeah, I think it feels a bit older. It, so there's some weird stuff going on here that ages the film. And then there's some other stuff in this film that holds up so damn well. 
Right, go on. Tell us about the stuff, the weird stuff that ages at first. So the complete and utter disregard for culture and people of colour. This feels like Great an stuff. this feels Great like an stuff. Indiana Jones. This, this feels like the film that came in between Temple of Doom and The Last Crusade. Yes. When this came out, Ben, this wasn't loved when it came out. It, that's it, certain, it, I'd it was, say it wasn't. It was a box office success, a major box office success and spawned two sequels. But it wasn't critically or commercially, commercially, yes, very successful. It wasn't critically or popularly as loved as it has gone on to be. And I think one of the reasons for that was it felt very much like a throwback. Yeah. Because you could, even though this came out as late as 1999... Like the same year as The Matrix or after The Matrix? The same year. Same um, year. Even though it came out that late, it, you could bang this in with mid-80s action films without a moment's hesitation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Straight to video, mid-80s action films. Absolutely. Because essentially what this is, is Indiana Jones and the Mummy. Yeah. Indiana Jones goes to Egypt. Indiana Jones is a bumbling man who goes to Egypt, but also gets involved in the mummy. Ben, the the big part of this and the big kind of cool thing about how this looks and feels is if you're doing a mummy, you have to set in the 20s or 30s. You just yeah. have to. You have to. It's very important. If you don't do that, it won't work. See... 2017's The Mummy with Sofia Botella from Out of Rebel Moon. Sofia Botella was in that! She was. She was she the was. mummy, in a sense. Oh, we've come full circle. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. We're done for today. That's grand. We've done it now. We've, we've got full <laughs> loop. It, yeah, Ben, look, obviously the reason that The Mummy is inextricably linked to the 20s is that's when Egyptian fever struck the British. Yeah, Egyptomania. Egyptomania struck the British in the 20s. You had... The real life characters of Lord Carnarvon? Yes. Yeah. And uh, what what are they called in this? Carnahan? Yeah, Car- Carnahan. Yeah. They skirt around it quite closely. Yeah. Yeah. But you can't do The Mummy without this 1920s Egypt vibe. Yeah, it's it's important. Like there's no... Egypt, Egyptomania was a horrific phase of British colonialism where thousands of years of culture were desecrated in favour of having your own mummy, mummy in your living room. Like it was... Yeah, you could just bring it back to Britain. It was bizarre. So the Egyptomania craze really started in the Victorian era, Michael. Um, and that was... It, it was a, a very popular thing to have a bit of a mummy to show off to your rich pals. Do you know what I mean? Um, and that huge demand led to waves of expeditions and i'm using air quotes there ladies and gentlemen you know to you know unearth cultural treasures but it was actually just a sales thing and that's represented very well in this film i think by john hannah yeah it's called grave robbing yeah it's called grave robbing and john yeah, hannah just grave robbers um john hannah is the perfect example of this the only kind of thing that dates the film is that in 2023 where we are now he would probably be a despicable character in this he's kind of the aloof comedy relief who's constantly nowadays looking he would, nowadays he would be played by that tall english fella there's he, a, he was played by that tall english fella in jungle cruise oh who's the tall what's english that guy's fella? name you know the guy who was dating Gemma chan what's his name the tall english fella oh, i don't know the tall english fella ben he was in that thing about teachers. D- Jack Whitehall? Jack Whitehall, that's oh, it. Oh, that's yeah, exactly he would, yeah. Who. That's exactly it. Jack, Jack Whitehall is John Hannah's spiritual successor. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. At least, in, at least in this role. Absolutely. So he would have been played by that and he would have been fairly despicable. But anyway, Egyptomania led waves of grave robbing. Um, to fill the living rooms of wealthy English people with bits of dead... Egyptians strange there was mummy paper mummy paint like uh, uh, the most bizarre kind of stuff going on and through all of this Michael there was a massive heaping dose of orientalism placed on top of Egypt and its culture Um, 
And one of the places that this film misses the mark, Michael, is that it doesn't do a lot to dispel Orientalism. <laughs> there is... There are very few Egyptian characters in this. And there's a lot of brown face. Is there? Go on. Uh, well, there's the there's the second gen there's the gentleman who works for the Americans, the Evie for the Americans, whose name I cannot remember. Um, the Evie for the Americans is he not a, a doctor? He's yeah, but he ba- he's basically the nerd for the American team. Um, hang on, let me get his name up here. But um, yeah, sorry, there's him. Benny is bizarre, Michael. Um, I don't know if Benny is meant to be Egyptian because when I was watching it with no, subtitles this time. He's Ukrainian. He's Hungarian, I thought. Oh, well, he's there. He's, he's an American actor, and you can tell he's an American actor because every time he says O'Connell, he yeah. slipped back into his American accent. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But he's definitely, I mean, he's, def- he's Eastern European. He's definitely not um, Egyptian. Yeah, okay, That's so that's good. So he's, um, yeah, he's Eastern European and he's there, but he's given a little bit of a, a foreignification. Because the, the the actor for him, Michael, is um, is very white. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, it's Kevin J. O'Connor about, is him. Yeah, I know he has like the most white name of all time. the The thing is, they are in a desert environment. People's skin does darken in a desert. Yeah. So the the other example that we have there, Michael, and the one I was trying to get was Doctor Alan Chamberlain is the character I'm thinking of. Go on. And he's played by a fairly, you know, a big 90s actor at the time, Jonathan Hyde. Yeah. Played him. You might recognise him from the original Jumanji. He played the hunter in the original Jumanji. He played Alan's father in the original right. Jumanji. He was also in Anaconda. That was Warren Westridge. Oh, yeah. And maybe where people might know him from, he was Bruce Ismay in Titanic. So he was a pretty big actor at the time. Um, mm. Jonathan Hyde, Michael, is... Uh, from Brisbane, Australia. <laughs> oh yeah, and uh, he's very white. <laughs> and um, in this, it's heavily implied that he is Egyptian, um, and he wears brown face in quite a bit of the episode. It's very strange. It's I I Ben he's, I do not think that it's implied that he's Australian. Uh, not it Australian. Alan Chamber. Egyptian. Sorry, Egyptian. I is it. Uh, I don't... There's a lot going on there, Michael, that I thought was very weird. I thought he got a little bit of brown face. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I think. I don't think he did. Like, he. I think they might have browned everyone up a little bit on the, with the kind of notion that they had been spending time in the desert and were getting a tan, specifically to distinguish them from yeah the pasty British. To, well, maybe it was who that. Were like, yeah, I. Like, I don't think he was supposed to be Egyptian. I could be wrong, okay. but I, I got no impression that he was supposed to be Egyptian. All right, well, I, I got a hint of it. But maybe I'm, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Anyway. Oh, was it because, Ben, halfway through he starts doing this? Yes, he does the classic hieroglyphic walk like an Egyptian <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, walk. <laughs> Absolutely. So, come here to me, Michael. Anyway, what? nothing is done to dispel this sense of Orientalism. So, Orientalism is uh, a term coined by a man called Edward Said. And it was, it's a very important term in terms of post-colonial thinking. Um, and it is the intentional mystification, uh, primit- I, I don't know how to say this, um, making a culture primitive and um, making a culture lesser and the the term that came out of it famously is othering where we intentionally dehumanize another culture in order to better take advantage of it as a civilized nation and i use civilized nation in air quotes once again but edward said was was the foremost kind of intellectual that coined this phrase and he looked at how especially in themes of literature and things like that we create other cultures and myths around other cultures and we paint them in a different light and that reduces their humanity somewhat and um, this was particularly common in victorian novels where a lot of victorian novels would prevent present foreigners as evil or twisted and you needed kind of the guiding civilizing hand of the british empire to help defeat them and stuff like this so this is all orientalism this movie does nothing to dismiss that michael <laughs> no no there 
the one character, the only place where I'm going to flat out agree with you, and it's funny that you haven't mentioned it, is the warden of the prison. Oh, Ahmed Jalili. <laughs> Ahmed Jalili, British, Iranian British actor Ahmed Jalili plays the prison warden, and he is just gross. He's gross and horrible and despicable and every negative stereotype you can imagine of a Middle Eastern person or a North African person from a 1920s British perspective. And he gets his comeuppance for being a greedy opportunist by having a horrible insect borrow into his brain and eat him. Michael, that uh, that was basically carry-on grave robbing. Like, it was, it was, <laughs> it was essentially that movie. It was yeah, bizarre. Yeah. He's a, such a strange character. And he is horrible. He's, yeah, he's, he's horrible. He's horrible. And I think Ahmed Jalili was just doing what makes him money anyway, because Ahmed Jalili doesn't talk like that. That's not Ahmed Jalili's accent, but he's made an entire career out of using his, I guess, his Iranian parents' accent. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, but he's gross and horrible and he gets killed. That's yeah. the only thing about it that I thought was egregious, because it's funny, like, in the late 90s, people were a little bit more culturally sensitive than the 1920s. But the the kind of... If I were an Egyptian person, what would be most upsetting for me about this was this has nothing to do with Egypt, really. It's British people and American people having an adventure. And my country and my culture is just an exotic backdrop for them. Yes. Um, but the, the, the prison warden is egregious. He's horrible. But anyway, Ben, forget about... Why, where it has culturally aged yeah because it's I I in my mind this is a this was the perfect adventure film it still is and I <laughs> this film's well, fucking great it, it's great but it's a it's not quite perfect how dare you spit on it, the grave of Brendan Fraser Brendan Fraser is very much alive and having yeah, a resurgence so know, he's yeah. doing alright yeah it's the Fraser's um, for Renaissance for yeah the 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 Brent Frasons. um, but it's it is great though, and the the whole setup is great. The actual adventure, the race to get to Hamanoptera, yeah, fab, good, fab bit of nineteen twenties adventuring. Great stuff from the lads. Great stuff. They get attacked on a ship. They've got guns, fights, and jumping and lepping. Michael, there's not a single quiet moment in this film. There's nothing no. that isn't undercut by, oh, fuck, what's this? What fresh hell is oh, this? There's explosions. Oh, there's people coming to get us. Oh, there's Benny's on the wrong side of the river. Oh, um, so, so much fun in that regard. Hey, O'Connell, we got <laughs> all the horses. Hey, Benny, <laughs> we're on the wrong side of the river. But like, so bizarre, but so good yeah. at the same time. And then once they get to Hominoptera, and once they start, uh, once they start raising the mummy accidentally, there's some. It, it takes a very quick sudden turn for the body horror and the just flat out scary stuff. Michael, I forgot how much this scarred me as a young flat. I I saw this far too young. Yeah, you were probably six. Uh, I yeah, I so I no, I was about ten. Oh, yeah. In 1999, I was eight. So I didn't see yeah. it when it originally came out. I think I saw it on VHS or I might have seen it on... I could have seen it on RTE's Big Saturday movie. Yeah, it would have been that sort of thing. All right, so, sure. Something like that. I saw it somewhere I shouldn't have seen it, right? And there is that tone switch midway through the film. And it's marked by a very specific scene where uh, the warden gets eaten by a beetle. Mm, it goes up into his brain. It goes into his brain and it kills him. And then there's mm. a second scene that marks that this is actually a bit grosser than we thought. And that's where all the workers get sprayed with acid. They get sprayed with acid and they all melt. They all melt. That's very strange. And then, Michael, what, what comes after that? Once the, once the four Americans... I do like the anti-American bias of this film. I like that the British are the good archaeologists for some reason. Yeah. But the Americans, yeah. with their guns and their guns gung-ho attitude capitalism oh <laughs> those those bold americans and i mean bold in the naughty sense not in the yeah. not in the brave sense they oh they get some come up and stuff <laughs> jesus fucking they, christ they do ben one of there's some weird stuff going on though where i think there's some stuff that just flat out doesn't make sense in this go on because i love the fact that the first person that the mummy captures is a guy who lost his glasses 
Yeah, it's and good. then the mummy gets his eyes yeah. and can't see very well and therefore thinks that Evie Carn- Carnahan is an Anuxuna Moon. Anuxuna Moon. And he's like, Anuxuna Moon? Is it you, Anuxuna Moon? And she's like, Yeah. Don't Sh- eat me. Shouldn't have said that. <laughs> yeah. Shouldn't have said that. So, but then it's really confusing because he thinks she is Anuxuna Moon. But then is later trying to sacrifice her to bring back a nooks on a moon. Ah, uh, Michael. What a, do- I what think a bit they, of double I logic. Think they, I think they changed some of this in, in production. Because even right at the start, it looks like the scene that they filmed at the start was the mummy sacrificing a nooks on a moon. Yes. But he wasn't. He was trying to bring her back or something. I think they changed the the relationship between the Mo- Imhotep and the Nuxuna Moon and Evie, I think they changed it post production because it doesn't make sense. Michael, when did Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula come out? Before this, yes. Did it come out b- much before that? Because I have a theory, and my theory what? is that. They changed this to better align with the success of Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula. Seven years before. Ah, so never mind. Uh, no, that theory doesn't hold any water then. But I, I don't know, maybe an executive went, that Dracula one was good because he was in love with uh, fucking Kate. What's her, what's her name? Not Rachel Weisz. She's in that same field. Who is she again? Winona Ryder. Winona Ryder, yeah. She's in that whole kind of Rachel Weisz, Winona Ryder, oh, yeah, Kate Winslet. White women of the 90s. White women of the 90s. <laughs> right, go on. Everybody's favourite girl group, white women of the 90s. Yeah. Um, come here to me. I think an executive was like, no, no, make them fall in love. <laughs> make him, make mm. him want make him want her as, as, as a colonel kind of figure. And it's like, oh, okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, there is that kind of oddness. Ben, one thing that really struck me about this was practically the opening scene is Patricia Velasquez as Anuxuna Moon, essentially naked. Essentially naked. I tell you what, and how did the censorship you board get that? that? No, you wouldn't get that in 2023. Let me tell you, you wouldn't. If 12 year old me was in the cinema in 1999 watching this, go, I wasn't 12 in 1999. You were not. I was 17. <laughs> um, but if I was watching this, I would have been like, oh, yep, yeah, good. This is oh. the type of film I'm looking forward Very to. Very nice. A bit of, a bit of tit. <laughs> Finally, Hollywood's reading my letters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fifteen-year-old me going. This is fabulous. They're finally making films for me for fifteen-year-old me. But it was a little bit odd to see in with a 2023 lens, in a essentially a kids action movie. She just sashays practic- up the middle of that aisle in the nip. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> fabulous stuff altogether, Ben. It's bizarre. It's bizarre. So it's it's really also, interestingly, she is the only one that really is exploitatively framed in that regard. Evie is played sexual sometimes. Yeah, when she's wearing the foreign women costume. That, yeah, so that's weird, isn't it? She, she When she gets a veil and conveniently yeah. her hijab has a yeah, see-through veil um, a very sexy hijab. yeah so you can see her big pearly whites when she gives rick o'connell a smile funnily enough though can i sorry can i cut across you, you she doesn't have pearly whites that is uh rachel vice's real teeth and it's very noticeable when she's sharing scenes with rick o'connell because rick o'connell and um, brendan fraser very much has hollywood teeth yes and rachel vice has real human teeth Oh, okay. I didn't notice that. I missed that completely. I very much noticed it. I've become obsessed now with noticing pearly white American teeth. Yes, they do have perfect teeth. There's a scene in, um, there's a, a Ridley Scott film called The Good Year, Michael. Go on. And it stars Russell Crowe as a British uh, banker, essentially. And he retires to the country, or he doesn't retire to the countryside. He's gifted a countryside estate by his uh, late uncle. And he meets an American in it and he goes, you're American. And she goes, how did you know? And he goes, because only Americans hand out licenses for teeth like that. <laughs> and I've never been able Very to good. un... I've never been able to unsee that as a, a concept. And anytime I see perfectly straight teeth, I'm just like, yank. <laughs> American. Ben, yeah. um, 
anyway, sorry to sorry for cutting across. You were saying that Rachel Vice appears wearing her sexy hijab, and there's a comedy Brendan Fraser getting a boner sound effect where it just <laughs> pretty, goes boy, 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 boy. pretty much like we're not we're not far off that. So there's a few interesting things that happen in that relationship. It, it, like it, it's not your traditional we talked about this last week on the podcast Michael their initial snog is very non-consensual he just plants yeah. one on her from between the prison bars that's another thing you'd never see today um, yeah you might ah, but he'd be the baddie it, it would be the baddie but it would paint you immediately as the antagonist not as the hero um, and then there's a little play on that scene a little bit later where Evie is horrifically drunk on Brandy and they were about to smooch and Rick O'Connell just kind of goes, all right, well, I'll just, I'll just let her sleep then. I'll be a good guy and I'll let her sleep. And I was just like, I've seen, I, w- I looked up some discourse on this and they're like, oh, that's so progressive. And I was like, no, no, it isn't. He just didn't have his way with her while she was passed out drunk. I don't know if that's progressive so much as the bare minimum. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know if that would have made him necessarily the goody. No, I don't think so. <laughs> Ben, ben, yeah. ben, my favourite character is the RAF pilot who wants to die. It, Winston is wonderful, isn't he? Is <laughs> it like, Winston? All right, we can arrange that for you. I and think it's like, Winston. Fabulous. Yes, fabulous. Tell you how. Uh, and he does. He succeeds. He yeah. just kicks the bucket. So, Michael, just to close us out, one of the one of the things that's fascinating with this is it, it has some real horror bones to it. That body horror element and the graphics used to render early Imhotep in resurrection phase phenomenal yeah. has held up remarkably well for a 1999 film yeah the special effects in general have held up well i think maybe the swarms are a little bit obvious as cgi now yeah and then the shroud that comes out of the the weird death pool oh yeah that that uh, didn't yeah. hold up spirit yeah, yeah yeah but overall the special effects in this remarkably hold up quite well especially for Imhotep as a half resurrected mummy the mm. the scene I'm thinking of in particular Michael the, the, there's that wonderful scene as you spoke about where the guy loses his glasses and then his eyes and his tongue um, that's yeah. serious body, body horror like that's where he's like you took my tongue and it's <laughs> it's horrific and then we kind of discover as we go along you know the, the mummy is kind of given to us in glimpses and, and touches here and there and then there's that scene where he turns and you finally get the full glimpse of his face and the scarab beetle runs out of his cheek and up through his skull. Ugh. Horrible stuff. <laughs> Horrible stuff. But as he keeps going through, we see the kind of regenerated versions of him and he's still horrific because that lower jaw detachment thing that he does is fucking awful. Yeah, and that 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 kind of aspect of body horror of look how far my jaw opens went on to contaminate horror for years that's the main scary thing about the baddies in I Am Legend that they're going ah yeah I've got and their you. mouths open too wide the, the I Am Legend baddies are pretty much just re-skinned Imhotep models Arnold, like. Arnold Vosloo's <laughs> yeah pretty much um, but ladies and gentlemen what did you think of Arnold Vosloo's skin in The Mummy there's a few different ways you can let us know radiant <laughs> radiant he looked great he was in great shape Good job, yeah. Arnold Wasser. For the 90s. I, I always thought it was Billy Zane until I went back and watched this film. Yeah. I was like, that's not yeah. Billy Zane. Yeah, yeah. Arnold Wasser that has been cursed by people thinking he's Billy Zane for his entire <laughs> career. <laughs> that's not Billy Zane at all. Um, but come here to me. Ladies and gentlemen, you can get in touch with us in a few different ways. You can find us on the interwebs at www.shomrabeug.com. S-E-O-M-R-A-B-E-A-G.com. It means tiny room in Irish. You can also find us on our Sherlock sure Listen podcast website from Acast. Yeah, have a look at it if you want. Yeah, we're up there on Instagram at Shalux Listen. Yep. Uh, and all sorts of reels. All sorts of reels. We make loads of reels. Some of them do quite well. And this week's winner was Baldur's Gate. Yeah, enormous reach for some reason. You hear that, the bloody Hollywood executives? Enormous reach. Okay? <laughs> enormous. Yeah, we'll shill anything. We'll shill anything. Uh, we actually won't. We do stand with SAG after, and we probably won't do that, which is unfortunate because now we might actually get a chance, but we can't. We won't do it. Yeah. Won't do it. Come here to me. Come here to me, ladies and gentlemen. What? The best way to get in touch with myself or Michael, two grand lads, is to hop up on our Discord. The link is down below in the description box. Get up there. Get on it. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it from us. We haven't discussed what we're talking about next week. Who knows? 
Who knows? <laughs> we'll never know. We'll never know. I never know. I can't tell. I don't know what's going on. I don't All know right, anymore. So. All right. See the pants stuff. Right. See you next week. Uh, bye. <laughs>